Okay, so good evening and this evening KK suggested the topic of dependent origination. So if you get confused, blame him. <laughs> so we're going to do a, I'm going to do my best at talking about dependent origination now. I have to assume that some people have no idea what that is, so we have to start somewhat from the beginning. And this particular teaching is one of the key teachings in Buddhism. So you have the Four Noble Truths, you have Karma, and you have Dependent Origination, really are the key tenets of Buddhism. And it's a very technical teaching and process that's given. I might just briefly explain why that is. The mythology around Buddhism says there are three kinds of Buddha, or fully enlightened being. One is a Buddha who has enlightened through faith. The second is a Buddha who is enlightened through wisdom. And a third is the Buddha who is enlightened through heroic struggle. Our Buddha, Sakyamuni, was of the second kind. He was enlightened through wisdom. And the wisdom one is ten times better than the faith one, and the heroic struggle one is ten times better than the wisdom one. So Sakyamuni Buddha reportedly said, where I have ten disciples, Maitreya Buddha will have a hundred. So the next Buddha will have a much broader reach. Uh, I think that's because the next Buddha will have YouTube and his teachings can go out a lot further. <laughs> the way of wisdom then was also called the Vaibhajavadin group, which are out of the different schools that arose after the time of the Buddha. You might know there was some 17 or 18 different schools arose, and they all had slightly different approaches. I think five of those schools were considered Vaibhajavadin, which means the way of analysis. And the idea is that by analyzing your experience in the right way, you can come to enlightenment. It does open the possibility that there is also enlightenment through faith, which in Indian terms would be bhakti yoga. Uh, what the heroic struggle method is, I don't know. Um, I'm kind of more attracted to a wisdom than heroic struggle. I like a kind of gentle struggle, the slow and easy path. I don't fancy heroic struggling too much. So this is a key part of this style of Buddhism, or this style of teaching that came from Sakyamuni Buddha, that if you analyze your experience in the right way, it will take you towards enlightenment. So a number of the teachings were very technical. For me, I like that because I kind of like engineering and I like psychology and I like things that fit together in the right way. This particular teaching has in its classic form has 12 links. And if I define Paticca Sumupada, which is the name of the teaching, and I define uh, Paticca, which is dependency, so it's two definitions, and then I define the 12 links, that's 14 things. Suppose I spend three minutes on each of the 14 links, that's going to be 42 minutes already, right? So. I don't want to do that, because all we'll have done is got through technical definitions of the terms. So instead of going through what these terms are, what I want to say is what they mean. And being inspired by Richard Feynman at the moment, he was a great physicist, and he could explain uh, physics in terms of things that you can understand. So. Uh, I'm taking his approach in this. I want to say what dependent origination means. 
when we come to what something means, of course, that entails an interpretation. And this is one of the difficulties in Buddhism, or indeed in any teaching other than science, I guess, uh, that the interpretations will vary and depends on your own viewpoint. So we can agree more or less on what the Buddha taught, but what did he mean by what he taught that we can disagree on and argue about? The way to think about this is from one of the opening scenes in the life of Brian. You may remember Jesus is doing the Sermon on the Mount and he says, blessed are the cheesemakers. And then you cut to some guys at the back of the audience saying, what's so special about cheesemakers then? And another guy says, I don't think he means cheesemakers. I think he means purveyors of all dairy produce. <laughs> so yeah, we can have a statement, but what was meant by that statement, we can argue about and disagree about. So what I will tell you is an interpretation of dependent origination, this key teaching. So in order to give this kind of interpretation or understanding, I'm necessarily going to shift over quite a bit into psychology. And psychology actually has a lot to add and a lot to embellish because the Buddha's teachings, although there were a lot of them in terms of texts, they were highly repetitive. So you find the same thing over and over and over and over again. And usually when the Buddha says something, he doesn't explain what he meant by what he just said. If he did, then you would wonder what he meant by that and so on and so forth. So we do have this difficulty with the interpretations. So this particular teaching, dependent origination or paticca sumupada in the Pali, is the way that the mind picks up objects. It's the way that the mind flows outside of itself and gets absorbed into objects of the world. So what we mean by that is in a room like this, in this kind of situation, you will tell yourself a story for how to interpret your interaction. But if you look at your actual experience, your actual experience is not the same as the story that you tell yourself about your actual experience. I like to analyze story, that's also one of my uh, things, but I'm going to put that stories aside, the stories that you use to try and uh, amalgamate your experience into some kind of way that you can interact with the world. When we look at the actual experience, of what's happening is your conscious attention is jumping around from one thing to another thing to another thing. So right now you look at me, you listen to me, and in a moment you'll see the candle flickering and your conscious attention will jump to the candle. And then from the candle it might look at the Buddha image and you might think is that a Sri Lankan Buddha image or an Indian Buddha image? and then your attention comes back to me and then your attention will flip to your bum which is aching a bit on the seat and you'll sh shift a little bit as you shift maybe your trousers get caught so you pull your trousers and your attention has gone onto that then you come back to me and you adjust your glasses and this is what is actually happening when you look at your experience you tell yourself the story that you've come here, you've listened to this Dharma talk, you've agreed or you've disagreed, or you fell asleep or you stayed awake, whatever it is. That's the story that you tell yourself, but the actual experience is not like that. The actual experience is your conscious attention is jumping around from one thing to another thing to another thing. So, there is an example of this you might look up. It's an old Skoda advert for Skoda cars. And they have a car there. 
and they're talk about, talking about the car and every few seconds the screen goes black and then it comes back on again and the car's still there and this happens about 20 or 30 times and what they're doing is every time the screen goes black and then the picture reappears they've changed something in the background so they've removed a window, they put in a door, they have a cat, they change it to a dog, they have a guy on a bicycle, they change it to a Segway, they have a greenhouse, they turn it to a red house. And at the end of the 30 second advert, they show you the original picture and the end picture and it is completely different. They've changed everything. But you didn't notice any of it. Even if I warn you, and now you're going to be not looking at the car, you'll be like looking for the things that changed. Even then, you're not going to pick up even half of the changes that they make. Because the mind picks up one object at a time. In this case, it's picking up the Skoda and asking you to look at the Skoda. This process is in psychology, it's called Gestalt. and in philosophy it's called phenomenology and what this means is in phenomenology it means that hmm, phenomenology is a method of investigating experience there are many different methods that you can use to investigate experience i shouldn't use the word method i should use the word model so there are different ways to model life, humanity, experience. Phenomenology is one particular model. It's not the only model, it may not be the best model, but it is the model that the Buddha uses also. And in this model it says that what's real is what is presented to your consciousness, your conscious awareness. Now your unconscious or your subconscious awareness may be aware of many things. But you don't know about that. You know about where the conscious mind has gone. So in the Skoda advert, your conscious attention is on the car. The background then can change and you won't even notice it. Uh, there are many, many experiments done on this, some of them quite amusing. For example, one experiment you can see also on YouTube they have people come in to do a psychology test in the university and when they come in they have to fill out a form and then they go into the next room when they go into the next room they say thank you very much you've finished the test and the test was filling in the form and what will happen is the person will come in and they'll see kind of like a white middle-aged guy sensibly dressed stood behind the counter and he'll say, oh, you come for the psychology test, just a second. And he'll dip down behind the counter to get you the form. But it will be a different man who stands up and says, here you go, here's the form. The question is, how many people notice that it's a different guy who stood up? Now, you all think that you'll notice, don't you? <laughs> They've even done this, changing it from a white guy to a black guy. <laughs> Male to female tends not to work so well. Um, but the sheer difference that you can have between these two guys is incredible. There's lots of YouTubes about this. Now, sometimes you will notice. But that's because when you come in, you've noticed the guy's jumper. and think, oh, I, I've got a jumper like that. And the second guy who stands up is wearing a completely different colour shirt or jumper. And then you'll be like, quite a few people said, you know, there was something weird. I knew there was something <laughs> odd. But most people don't notice. And this is because the way conscious attention works is it picks up one object at a time. You notice one thing at a time. Right now, are you aware of the sound of the air conditioner? Were you aware of the air conditioner sound before I mentioned it? 
But were you aware of it the whole time that you came in? No. When you when I mention it, you're like, well, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty sure I noticed that. I'm not sure at what point I came into the room I noticed it, but I'm sure I must have noticed it. So while I'm asking you, were you aware of the air, air conditioner, could you feel the feeling in your right foot? Can you feel your right foot now? Give it a little wiggle, right? Now your attention has gone to your right foot and that's in your conscious attention. While that's in your conscious attention, you're not noticing the color of the, of the fan. And if I was to ask you afterwards, even though you've been looking in this direction, what was the color of the fan, you'd probably have no idea. Unless you'd happen to pick that out when you came into the room. So this process of looking at one thing at a time with the conscious awareness. Now, your subconscious may well be aware of many different things. This is why when you're reading a book, you're absorbed in the book and there's general chit-chat going on around you but somebody in that room mentions your name and you... how do you know that? your conscious awareness was only with the book it wasn't scanning the, the room it's called the cocktail party effect again, look up on YouTube you can see lots of good, well-researched experiments done on this so the supposition is that while you're reading your book, your subconscious is actually aware of more, th more things. And if something in that field of awareness is quite, a, quite strong, quite attention-grabbing, the subconscious sends the word up to the CEO, and the CEO is like, what? And turns the attention around. You might notice this when you hear a bang you ever notice that you start reacting to the bang before you hear it? If you're mindful, you'll be like this before you actually hear the noise. Reason for this is the neural pathways uh, in the brain uh, have various different pathways and the pathway that goes through conscious awareness is quite slow. So the sound can actually come in and start triggering a response before it's had time to actually get around to conscious attention. Again, there are a lot of very uh, interesting experiments done around this. One of them you might notice hmm, is, do any of you ever see with a clock that when you look at a clock, the second hand goes backwards for a second and then goes forward? Has anybody seen that? You have to have a clock where the second hand ticks second by second. If it's moving continuously, you won't find it. So, what happens is, the conscious attention is actually quite slow, but it will pick up one object at a time. And this is where you reside. The you the I, the self, is in that conscious attention, not with the unconscious or subconscious attention. Now when it picks up an object, this is what's called in psychology a gestalt. And the gestalt means um, a unified object, unified out of parts. So if you're looking at this Buddha image, there's a head, there's a base, there's the arms, there's the ears. Is this one thing or many things? In psychology and philosophy, that's an impossible question to answer. We can't really say, well, where does the Buddha image begin and where does it end? But in Gestalt, we can. We say, well, the mind will cut out of the experience that you're having this object and present the object to consciousness. When it presents the object to consciousness, everything else recedes into the background and becomes more fuzzy. And what will happen actually, again, many, many, many tests that we do on this, the background will lose contrast. So you'll lose the ability to see the differences in colors and contract. Uh, 
The background will also have the property that it's completed behind the foreground object that you are looking at. Now the foreground object is a gestalt, means a collected from parts. So in this instance, the ears, the nose, the color, the material that it's made from, the size. Uh, also included in the gestalt is the weight, for example, or the cost, or the value, or its precariousness. Is it stable or unstable? All of these things will present themselves together with the object as a phenomenon. That's why they call it phenomenology. Now, what will happen is after you've picked that out as your foreground object, then you can't sustain attention onto it for very long, so the attention will jump to the flowers. Where were the flowers when you were looking at the Buddha image? You kind of assumed that you knew they were there, but actually that's a story that you're telling yourself. So, in the early psychology, this was called, this is a fellow called Rubin, and uh, he's more known as a kind of art theory than anything else. Uh, but he called this figure and ground. He said the object that you have in your consciousness is the figure, and everything else becomes the ground on which the figure appears. The figure can be plural, it can be quite big. So, for example, I can look at you all now and call into my mind the figure audience. So now all of you, although you're multiple, appear as one thing. And everything that isn't audience is fading into the background, becoming more fuzzy. I could look at this room now and say red things. And then red things are going to start popping out and I'll see the redness. I can see the redness in you have a red thing just here in your shirt. I didn't notice that until I said red. So what you will draw out of your sensory experience also depends on your will and your intention. So according to Buddhism in dependent origination, this is where the process starts. The element is called Sankara. But Sankara in this instance there are many arguments about definitions of terms. But in this instance, means an action, an action of body, an action of speech, or an action of thought. In psychology and philosophy, this is called intentionality. It doesn't mean what you intend. What it means is that consciousness always has an object that it's looking at. You never see consciousness you only see consciousness of an object. Now the Buddha had a very nice analogy by which to understand this. And he said, imagine a cow. And the cow leans its hide against a tree. While it's leaning against a tree, the hide is getting bitten by tree mites. Tree critters, let's say. So the cow doesn't like this, so it moves away from the tree and it lies down in the grass. Now the cow is being bitten by grass mites. So the cow gets up and goes into the water. Now its hide is being bitten by water mites. So it comes out of the water and stands in the sun. Now its hide is being bitten by air mites. And wherever the cow leans its hide, those things are going to bite its skin. That was the Buddha's example. Is that perfectly clear? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, the things that the cow might lean its hide against are the senses, so in the analogy, so things that you can see, things that you can hear, taste, smell, touch, or think. And wherever conscious attention goes, you're going to get bitten by those objects. So if your attention goes to the Buddha image, that's something that you can see. So now you're being caught or trapped in seeing. Now if your attention goes to your right foot, you're getting caught or trapped in the feelings in your right foot. 
So where the cow goes and leans against six different kinds of objects and it always gets bitten, in the same way your conscious attention moves between different objects. But wherever your conscious attention goes, there you're going to get bitten. Bitten means you're going to get caught up or trapped in that sensory experience. Consciousness in Buddhism arises with the object that you are looking at. Now this is different to our idea of consciousness in English. In English, you know, consciousness studies is a total mess right now. Uh, so it's difficult to make much sense of it. But in general, we think of consciousness in terms of English or in psychology as something that you have, either bright or dull. So the first way that psychologists investigate consciousness is to look at you when you're asleep. Because they say, well, then you're not conscious. So they feel conscious is a thing that's either open and receptive, like in the morning you have virtually no consciousness, and then you have your coffee and your porridge, and your consciousness starts to wake up, and then you get to work, and then it's closed down. <laughs> Uh, when it comes to lunch, you're like, oh, food, and your consciousness is like wakes up again. You come to a boring Dharma talk and your consciousness fizzles out altogether. You sit on the bus and your consciousness. So that's the way that we think of it in English. Uh, psychology tends to follow that kind of view. But in Buddhism, there is no such thing. Consciousness arises with the object that you are looking at. So the Buddha's teaching on this, he said that a grass fire is reckoned by the fuel that feeds it, which is grass. A dung fire is reckoned by the fuel that feeds it, which is dung. A log fire is reckoned by the fuel that feeds it, which is logs, and so on. So what that means is when you see something, consciousness is reckoned as I consciousness. If now you shift to what you can smell, that I consciousness has died, disappeared, extinguished. And now you have nose consciousness. So in Buddhism, consciousness isn't a thing that's there the whole time. It arises with the object and it ceases when your attentions move to somewhere else. Their consciousness fires up again. Now what happens when you put your attention onto an object? Various different things happen depending on your intention. So we started the thing with Sankara, intentionality, which is which direction you're sending your mind. So when you put your attention onto something, you have like a cascading effect, which may be weak or may be strong. So for example, you look at me right now and you have an interpretation of what a monk is, what a monk is supposed to be. If I pulled out of my bag a pair of black glasses and a fake nose, you would feel that's out of place, right? You'd feel a little uncomfortable. What's happening is your conscious attention has now been caught up or bitten or fueled by me and my fake glasses and fake nose is kind of disturbing you a little bit and you're going to like that or dislike it. Maybe you think, oh, he's got such a great sense of humour. Look at him bringing out... I haven't got fake glasses and I don't expect that. Or you might think, yeah, that's a bit stupid. We get the point. You don't need to do that. But what's happening is you've picked me out as an object and now you're starting to judge what you like and dislike, how you think it should be, how you think it should progress. Then your attention shifts to your bum on the seat. And then you're going to like it or dislike it. Usually you won't notice the feeling of your bum on the seat unless you dislike it. Right? Then you've got a judgment. You're like, nah, do I need this cushion? Is this cushion... Maybe I'll get one of the other cushions, or maybe I'll move to a chair. What's happened is you've got caught into that sensory experience. You've started to judge it. 
started to relate to it and started to interact with it. Then your conscious attention will jump somewhere else. When it lands on that thing, you're going to get this, I like to think of it as like a firework or like a nuclear bomb because it kind of it can happen slow enough that you can see it, that it starts to fire up into this whole thing. Right now, if I, I'm going to mention something to you, look into your minds and see your reaction. This thing that I'll mention is something that you know about, but note that it's not in your mind right now. But when I mention it, it's going to come into your mind and then you're going to have a reaction to it. So try to observe this process as it happens. Are you ready for your object? Donald Trump. So what happens? What happened? Did anybody notice anything? You guessed it before I said it. <laughs> You're like, no, no, don't say that. Those are the anticipation of these things. So there's a reaction, right? You like him or you dislike him or you think it's funny that I mentioned Donald Trump or you think it's think Donald Trump does not belong in a Dharma talk and I shouldn't have said it. But there's a uprising of feeling. Now, if you're mindful, then that feeling isn't going to get very far before it fizzles out. But if you're not mindful, it will come up and you like, you'll start, yeah, yeah, he's such a terrible president and or maybe you really like him, you're like, yeah, I can't wait till he builds a wall. And so then the mind is grasped onto it. And then this whole firework or this nuclear bomb will come up and start to flower out. When it flowers out, what you end up with is conscious engagement with the object. And in the Pali, this is called bhava or becoming. So... Uh, one of the ways the Buddha talked about this is he said, where you put your attention, if there is attachment and grasping, then consciousness becomes stationed at that thing. So, you put your attention onto Donald Trump, if there's some attachment, you start thinking about it, and your consciousness is stationed with that object, and will stay around that object. I like him, I don't like him, I want him to do this, so think he'll do that, will he win the next election, and uh, who's going to stand against him? You put your attention right now is not on your mortgage. But if that comes up into your awareness for any reason, because you've remembered it or because something somebody said, you know, if you're having some difficulty with your mortgage or you're happy because you're just paying off your mortgage, this will come up and your consciousness gets stationed at that object. And you can stay on that topic for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour, right? And then what happens is you get this feeling like... <sighs> Usually then you adjust, you know, oh, my knee aches a little bit, and then you look around and... Okay, I'm, uh, what am I having for dinner tonight? <laughs> now your attention has gone around that object and has become stationed with that thing because of attachment, because you like it and you dislike it, and you get this whole flowering of experience comes up because you've put your attention there. If you're not attached, then as something comes up into your conscious awareness, there might not be very much attachment and it just disappears. So if you're sitting in the park as I was today, sitting in the botanical gardens. I'm sorry, I'm going to say this every year that I come here. Why do you call it botanical gardens? All gardens are botanical. <laughs> it's like saying I went surfing in the wet ocean. I mean, that oceans are wet. So, my little rant, I'll do that every year. So you mentioned botanical gardens to me. What happens? This whole association will come up in me and like, of course it's botanical. So I sat there in the gardens today and I was looking around 
and I liked the feel of the grass under my feet because I was sitting on my shoes and my feet were in the grass and I liked that and then I saw somebody walking by and I, oh I like a uh, dog, Labrador and then the birdie tweeted and I, oh, it's nice to hear the birds and then the sun went down, went in and like other oh, suns. So my attention is moving around quite freely because I'm not very attached to the experience, the objects that are coming into my consciousness. If I liked birds, which I don't, but if I did, I might try to identify the sound of the bird, like what kind of bird is it? Should it be here in this season and where does it come from? So this is dependent origination. This is your mind will pick up one object after another object after another object. When it picks up an object into conscious attention, you get this whole flowering of ex phenomenal experience will come up in relation to that object. You may get stationed with that object if it's something that's important to you, or you may simply pass on to another object if it's not important to you. The last part of this puzzle, when an object has come up into your conscious attention, this object comes up with a lot more than you are consciously aware of. So, let's use the Buddha image again. Uh, when the Buddha image comes up, you're aware of what it is. You're not just aware of how it looks, but you're aware of what it is. Your associations with it. If you're a Christian or Muslim, you will think this is a graven image that's being worshipped. So you'll think you won't like this. If you're a Buddhist, you're like, well, this is not quite peaceful. If you're an artist, you might wonder what kind of image it is, Sri Lankan or Thai or whatever. So you'll notice that there is a physical side to this object and there's also a mental side to the object. So in Buddhism we classify this as rupa, which is the form or the shape. And everything, every object that comes into consciousness has a form or a shape. But together with that form or shape is also whether you like it or dislike it, or in some cases are neutral. So I mentioned Donald Trump. You can't have Donald Trump come into your mind without liking or disliking. It's going to be there at the same time. Possibly you're neutral to Donald Trump. You're also going to have your memories of what that object is. So your perception of Donald Trump is going to come up together with the word or the image Donald Trump. So that's sanya or perception. Vedana is liking or disliking it. There's also Jadana, which is intention, but here intention means whether you're going towards it or whether you're going to reject it. Like, it's not the same as liking and disliking because you can go towards an object that you dislike. You might give me some unpleasant medicine, cod liver oil, because I'm coughing and you give me cod liver oil and I don't want it, I don't like it but I'm going to take it. Right? So jadana or intention is towards or away from the object, uh, but it's not the same as liking and disliking. And finally, there is attention. You are paying attention to that object. So when an object arises, it must have a physical form and it must have a mental side to it at the same time. Now in Gestalt, in psychology, we analyze this a lot, 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 lot more than Buddhism does. The Buddha stopped there. He said you can't have any physical form without the mental side, and you can't have any mental form without a physical side. Now I found that interesting, because I thought, well, can't you have something that's mental without any physical side? No sight, sound, smell, touch, or anything. So I thought of the most abstract thing that I could think of. A couple of things that I thought of, but one of them was democracy. Because it's totally, it, does that have a physical form? You might imagine the Statue of Liberty holding up her ice cream there, and maybe that's your physical form. 
I thought, but that's totally abstract. That's completely mental. There's no, there is no physical side to that whatsoever. But then I realized I can't get that object into my mind without the word democracy. I have to have the word or I have to have a symbol in order for that thing to come into my mind in the first place. So the Buddha, in my opinion, was totally correct. You cannot have something physical without the mental side and you can't have something mental without the physical side. He said this will arise together in what psychology calls a gestalt, an object. But that object will include a lot more than you can just uh, see, hear, taste, smell and touch. This whole thing will arise together as a complete thing and it will cease together as a complete thing. And this is where you get the famous analogy of the monkey swinging through the forest. People think this means monkey mind, you're thinking too much. That's absolutely not what it meant. The monkey swings through a forest, grabbing hold of one bough, letting go, only to hold on to another bough, only to let go, to hold on to another bough. Even so, does this mind move from one object to another object to another object? That was the teaching of the monkey mind. But it's, it's not that you're thinking too much, it's that you can't help it. So all of this is how the process arises. We pick an object out and this whole process erupts into experience. We get caught in this process of always engaging in objects because of avicca. And avicca is always translated as ignorance. But actually vicha means the method, methodology. Avicca means not having the method not understanding the method or the, not understanding the process. Now, we come to the last part of the puzzle and the question. What would happen if your mind doesn't go out to any object? Every moment of your conscious experience and probably unconscious too, your mind is always going out to some object. You can't stop it, right? It's always going to be something even if you meditate like a champion and focus your mind onto the breath your mind's still flowing out to the breath right still all you're doing is replacing one object with another object and this is the difficulty that all enlightened people have because when you go and ask them well what do i do all they can tell you is get another object, switch this object for that object. Metta is better than hatred. Renunciation is better than greed. Sure, but we just, you know that phrase, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic? Right. You're just rearranging stuff in the mind. You might make a better mind that way, but you will never get to enlightenment because you're just changing one object to another object. So, this is why our process in meditation is to start to break this habit of the mind picking up objects. And that's why when you hear something, you stop the mind hearing, hearing. You bring the mind back. When you think something, it's just thinking, thinking. You bring the mind back. When you feel something, it's feeling, feeling. You bring the mind back. If you keep doing this, Every once in a while, the mind will just collapse. Collapses or implodes, I like that word. Implode in on itself. And the mind just becomes aware of its own self. The mind becoming aware of the mind without flowing out to any particular object. This experience is bright. It's very, very clear. It's stationary. Even if the mind is still moving around, the experience itself is stationary. And most people do get this in meditation. But because you're not accustomed to it, immediately when you see that, you make it into an object of the mind, right? So the mind's like, oh, that's, that's my mind. And you're already, you've separated. Uh, but if you're mindful and you keep 
bringing the mind back, not allowing the mind to go too far into any particular object. And your observance, every so often you notice this brightness of experience when the mind's not going out to any particular object. So, Lumpo Dun, one of the famous Thai masters, he's very much a Zen master, he would answer in these very short, like two lines. They said to him, what are the Four Noble Truths? And Lumpo Dun answered, when the mind goes out to an object, it's suffering. The mind going out to an object is the arising of suffering. When the mind has no object, that's the end of suffering. And withdrawing the mind from all objects is the path to the ending of suffering. She crystal clear, beautiful, if you know this process of dependent origination. So, Agnitmi sidestepped most of the terms in dependent origination, but we've actually covered the things that are in there because I wanted to talk about what dependent origination is rather than going through all the technical terms and details. The Gestalt uh, analyzes this a lot, lot more. Obviously, psychology has no, has no inkling that there might be any moment mind isn't going out to an object. It has no idea about enlightenment. So that's clear. But in terms of analyzing the object, then psychology uh, has taken this a lot further. The school was called Gestalt, and it came from the uh, Germany in the 1930s. And most of the Gestalt theorists were Jewish, and so they were chased out of Germany by the Nazis, and their whole school kind of like got broken up, and so it is more or less considered a defunct school of psychology these days. But if you want to know more about how the mind picks up objects and how it relates to objects, then Gestalt is the school to go to. Okay, so that's dependent origination. Is it clear enough? I'm not accustomed to explaining this in this manner, so I, I often use you guys as my guinea pigs. It is in fact the topic of my thesis in university, so when I get back to Bangkok, I'm going to have to defend my thesis. So I was very keen to try it out on you today. One thing to note, for those of you who know the classical teaching, there's these 12 links, and it starts with avichar, not knowing, goes into intentionality with an intended action. So the mind is always acting in Buddhism, three actions, body, speech, or mind. Then it goes into nama rupa, Nama Rupa is the name and form, but that's the gestalt of the figure. In actual fact, the ground has a big influence on your experience too. Uh, the Nama Rupa and consciousness. But these terms in Buddhism can switch. And so many, 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 many different versions of this process. This is why I think it's good to understand what the process is of the mind picking of objects, then when you see it written in all kinds of different formats, you can see what it's getting at. But the point of the word dependency was not cause and effect, which people imagine. So it's not going from 1 through to 12, because many of the links will switch places. They call it dependent genesis. and all. But what it isn't, many people say that everything depends on everything, everything's connected. Me being here depends on a farmer who grew my rice and a plastic worker who made the container that my rice came in. Everything's all connected. And people kind of say that, but that doesn't fit with any sutta whatsoever. It's a lovely theory and it might well be true, but it isn't dependent origination. I, I might mention there's another interpretation that dependent origination occurs over three lifetimes. So, 
I'm not going into that today, but um, just to mention that people do have different interpretations, which is where I started out saying, we know what the Buddha said, but what did he mean by what he said can vary. Because people don't know about Gestalt, and this whole beautiful theory of Gestalt and figure appearing on ground, this whole process is something people aren't really conscious of or aware of. And I think if they knew about Gestalt, then dependence origination would just make sense. It's the process where the mind picks up objects. Yeah. Anybody else have a question, comment? Although it's presented as 12 links, any sutta that actually talks about the process usually doesn't have 12 links. There's 10, or there's 9, or there's 16, or there's 24. I mean, it, it, there's a lot of different versions of it. So the 12 links is just like a formulation that they've put together for recitation purposes. If your mind truly has stopped going out to objects, by definition it should be enlightened. But I can attest to what that is not. And that is not another object of attention. Which is what we tend to do, right? When me doing meditation we like, well I want to be peaceful, or I just want to see the breath. You're just switching one object for another object. It might be more refined or more pleasant, it might be more holy, but you're just switching the objects for another object. And that's why you never get to enlightenment like that. It's only when the system collapses in on itself and the mind is just revealed or enlightenment is just revealed as something that must have always been there. By definition, enlightenment doesn't arise. So it's not something that you can attain to because anything that arises ceases, right? So it's something that's already there and in Mahayana they use the word Buddha nature which is handy to have a word for it. In Theravada it's called unconditioned. So it's the thing that hasn't arisen as an object. In terms of meditation experience, my teacher was very clear, he said, no, you will feel it and know it. The mind will come together and it'll be very clear, it'll be very bright. Uh, it'll be very centered, centered. it'll actually be centered within the body. Uh, other things, your body might feel very large. Many people have this experience in meditation. The body, you, you wonder how your body is fitting in the room sometimes, it becomes so large. It can also disappear. But so there are certain experiences that are the right experiences because your mind's no longer going out to an object, no longer creating an object. 